Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It is great to be here with you today. Welcome to the next uh, webinar in our WCT Bite Size Rum series in collaboration with the West Indies Rum and Spirits Producers Association. Uh, my name is Rob McKacky. I'm our Head of Business Development for Spirits here at the WSET. I'm sure you are all familiar with who we are at WSET, but we are the leading provider in spirits, wine, sake, and beer qualifications, something we've been doing for a little over 50 years through our network of over 800 providers in 70 countries. A little bit of housekeeping on today's session. It is being recorded, and you'll be able to review it again over and over till your heart's content on our uh, Events Hub channel on YouTube. Um, if you do have any questions today, rather than using the chat, if you would like to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, um, we'll do our best to get to any of those today. Any that we run out of time for our events team will add their email address at the end of the session so you'll be able to email us those questions and we'll be able to get the answers to you. Um, today's session is very exciting. We have with us Devon Date from um, Renegade um, Rum Distillery uh, there in Grenada. He has been in the industry for over 20 years and basically does everything from cane through to bottle. Devon is the guy who makes sure that we get these delicious cane spirits. And we're very, very excited to have someone with his expertise with us today as a distillery manager there and director to talk us through what they do at Renegade Rum and to answer your questions. So that's all from me. I'm going to jump off your screen and hand over to Devon. Devon, take it away. Thank you, Rob. And thank you for having um, Renegade Rum as part of this um, widget series. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to share our experience with, with you and, and your, your viewers in terms of what we do and the philosophy of our production at Renegade Rum. Um, so just to start off, Renegade Rum, basically, we are, as Rob said, we are located in Grenada. Um, our distillery infrastructure, we are one of the, the most modern distilleries in the Caribbean. Um, recently constructed in 2018. Uh, we, our infrastructure is on five acres of land, of course, as you can see, we have a utility building, uh, which house the utilities that support the fermentation and distillation process, um, with, meaning that they have the boilers, the meal, the cooling towers, the, the chillers, and CIP system, process water, and so on. Then we have the brew house where we do our fermentation, we also have the steel house where we do our distillation, and thus far we have two cask warehouses. Our home, of course, is Grenada. Why Grenada? To give a brief history of it is that our investors and our current CEO, Mark Rennie, they, they are big on the terror driven projects in terms of terror in wine and terror in spirits. Um, they have proven, well, we all know that terror in wine production has been proven, and so far, our, our CEO and investors have a distillery in Waterford where they are doing terror in whiskey production. Now, they want to transform it and see if we could get it into, into spirits production, meaning mainly rum. Um, it was never heard of before in the rum industry, but, um, but we decided that's, that's from the basis of our project. When we talk about terror, of course, we talk about a complete and natural environment in which the spirit is produced including but not limited to, of course, factors of the soil, topography, and climate. I mean, the what we're trying to prove in our philosophy of production is that the characteristic taste and flavor imparted to the spirit by the environment is in which it is produced. So why Grenada, as they were looking for a place to, to start or to <laughs> initiate that project, they, fortunately for us as Grenadians, um, they landed in Grenada. Because of our hilly volcanic terrain, our wide range of altitudes and soils and microclimates, it is ideal for growing tower driven cane, tower derived cane, sorry. And so Grenada formed the home of the Renegade Rum project. Now we, we decided to plant our own, own cane. So in 2016, the company Cane Co was incorporated, which, was, which is a little bit different from how most projects start because the, the agriculture part of the project started before the actual distillery was built. And in 2016, 2016 it was it can cause incorporated with the with the, the main objective of course is to see if we could a feasibility study in terms of if we could produce the raw material for the to sustain the distillery and, and the production from sugarcane. 
Consequently, construction of the distillery started in 2018, but it completed in 2020. Why? Because of COVID-19, of course, a lot of factors to busy. The actual construction, the, the suppliers who supply the equipment couldn't travel to come and install the equipment or commission it. And so, so we had a break in there because of COVID-19. So that's why we have this, this delay in terms of, of starting the project. Become the first commissioning office started in 2020 in September, of course. So we had our first installation on our port still. And then in 2020, we started production. But at that point, we haven't we were not in steady status yet. So we took the whole year 2021 to really start in terms of getting the, the equipment, getting the operators acquainted with the equipment and trying to get the, the process into steady state. The structure of our production team, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is responsible for supplying the sugarcane. That's our agriculture arm. We have over 100, over 120 people in the field planting sugarcane, uh, harvesting sugarcane, and maintaining the sugarcane. And the renegade rum distillery is responsible for the production of the spirits from the sugarcane. We have a staff of around 36 people, which include persons, which include operators plus our administration staff. Um, as far as the farms are so is concerned, we have about 14 farms now available. Our acreage under cultivation, around 300 acres. Our smallest farm is around four acres. Our largest is, is around 40 acres. Um, later on in the presentation, you'll hear me talking about farm and fields. We have fields that is a little plus within the different farms. Um, we have 167 of that. And so far, we have 52 natural environment um, different type of soils and topography and climate that we call refer to as our terror. Now when we talk about production at Renegade Rum, we, we pride ourselves in saying that we have what we call the whole the trinity of rum production is the three T's. So we're driven, traceability, and transparency. I'll spend a little time talking on, on that slide because it's important. I mentioned earlier about terror and the fact that it is because of our microclimates in Grenada and our or different toys, soil types and so on, we have that tower driven, we, we, we get tower derived sugar kit. Now traceability is important, and it, we pride ourselves in that part of our production philosophy, meaning that each farm, each field, each variety of kin, each tower is processed separately, because we want to prove that each, if we have to prove that each one, each different tower gives us a different um, profile of rum, a different variety of cane give us a different type of rum and so on. We want to prove that, so we process that separately. So that, that photo in the center of your screen, you'll see that when the cane come to the plants, we have a million, a million uh, or what we call an origination code. So first of all, the, the cane will come to the plant and we'll start milling that sugar cane. When that, that sugar cane, it will fill two wash baths, so two fermenters. So you see, you go from that first blue earth and you go to two second blocks, which means that all the juice that was processed that day from that particular farm and that particular field went to two washback, washback A and washback 6A and 6B. Now, when that's, that will be fermenting there in that washback, we, we refer to our washback as fermenters. And then when we're ready for distillation, if you notice on that screen again, washback A, when the three arrows that come from washback A that go down to when you say 24 PS, that means that three. We get three batch of pot still rum. We process three batch of pot still rum from that particular wash bag. Consequently, wash bag 6B went to produce CS, which is column still rum, and part of A went to column still also. The point we're trying to make here is that each wash bag is processed separately, whether it is pot still or column still. So when the cane is coming, the cane has its origination code. The type of the farm, the field, the terroir it comes from, it goes to a particular washback processed separately. And those washbacks you know, will be, when it is fermenting, the juice is processed either on the pot still or the column still. And we trace how much batches we get from that particular washback on the column still, and how much we get on the column still, on the pot still, sorry. Then when time comes for aging that rum, you notice that a blue, sorry, a green and that orange sticker there. It, it means that. One go the wash box that was processed on the column still goes and is aged separately in different casks as compared to those that was processed on the pot still goes into a different set of casks also. So they are all aged, they are all processed in terms of fermentation, distillation, and aging separately. And then in the eventually 
at the end, it depends on the type of rum that we want or the type of blend that we go and decide what we add and what we don't add. So this is a full traceability. We have a, our own program called ProTrace, which speaks to that. So you could go, when you, when you get a bottle of Renegade rum and we go to transparency, you know, you have a cane code. In that rum, there's a code. You type in that code on, on our website and it will give you a full traceability as to when the cane was harvesting as if for the first the first um, block in the photo, when it was when it was milled, when it was the life cycle of the wash box that it went into, when it was distilled, what it was distilled on, the distillation expression, whether it is pot or column, and then what type of cask it went to. And, and so you have a full traceability of the product. And so you could so you could speak about the, the repertoire of, of, of the of the or the taste or whatever, or the traceability or the origin of the product that you will be drinking from Renegade Rum. Our materials, as, as we say, we aim for the extraordinary using sugarcane as a primary source of our rum's natural flavor. Um, we are currently, we started on six varieties, but we have four varieties now across 14 farms, as I mentioned. Each farm, as I say, provides distinctive towers and flavors, as you can see in the photo on to the right of the screen, and you could look at the soil type and see some differences in it, although they belong to the same farm, and how they are, or when we talk about the field and the table, how they are, they are in sections or in plots, as we will say. And, um, and when we harvest it, they're all processed and, and harvested separately. They are adapted to various soil types and altitudes, and microclimates. We had weather stations in the field also where we could measure the amount of rainfall for a particular farm, a particular for a particular area to compare because we are uh, we are cognizant of the fact that probably in 2021 the amount of rainfall in a particular field may vary from 2024 and then so we could do that comparison also so at that point it's important to know that the renegade rum although we are a, we are a producer of rum we also this is this forms part of a study for us also we have those we have projects and stream where we do we actually study using those data to, to understand that, that what other factors that really contribute to terror driven uh, um, spirits. Our harvest period is a bit long now from January to, to September, or we start at February sometimes to September. I mean, the idea here is of course to shorten the, 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 the harvest season, um, but because we are playing catch up in terms of, we had cane on the ground and we have to, we have to get it um, harvested and so, but um, our, our agricultural general manager will, is is will tell you that he is he's, um, working hard in terms of shortening the harvest season because data from production over the two past two years shows that that there is a particular time of the season, the dry season, for example, or from February to May, for example, we get better yields in terms of production benchmarks, and um, and when the rains are falling, there's a little more complication in terms of harvesting, even cleaning, and um, lower sugars in the cane and and, and so on. So he's working tediously to, to shorten that, that, that season. The cane delivery and milling, they deliver directly from the fields. So our, our cane cutters, our harvesters, sorry, they will, they will start around 6 a.m. and start cutting the cane. When that cane comes to the plant, so we start milling around 10 a.m. for the day. So the cane, the cane will come to the plant and we try our best not to have cane overnight. So from the field to the mill, so we have fresh cane. As uh, I said, when it comes in, we have a, a way bridge where we create an origination code for a ticket, like the tons of cane that is coming, the farm that it comes from, the, the field it was harvested, the variety of cane, and the terroir. All that forms the, the, forms the, the, the initial part of our, our traceability project. Um, as mentioned again, each farm field and variety is processed separately. Our milling process, we have three mills in tandem. The capacity of our mill is seven to 10 tons of cane per hour. Our target is 75 tons of day, although we could do more than that. And, and there are times we do less than that, but that our initial target is that. Um, we, we pride ourselves in clean cane, of course, and we talk about imbibition water in the cane, depending on the, the, the bricks of the, of the juice and so on. Now, the preparation of our juice for fermentation, we, the, the first one is very important. We have a, a, a filter, a filter a filtration system on the mill, which we call a rotary screen. Um, this removes a lot of the solids and bagger seal, meaning that the small fine pieces of bagger in the cane, because from our experience, uh, we notice that if those escape and go into fermentation, they are, very, they are precursors of, of methanol forming in it, 
So we, we very pay particular attention to that uh, filter screen and ensure that it is working and clean properly to have clean juice for, for fermentation. Our juice is transferred to a 25 cubic meters um, juice tank, the one, that big one you see in there. And we have a yeast makeup, that's the nestle tank, which we use, uh, we, we rehydrate our yeast and then we are, and our nutrients make up in there. As you know, sugarcane juice do not have as much nutrient, minerals and nutrients as molasses. So we use a nutrient cocktail to, so that we could help our yeast multiply so that um, we get the, the amount of yeast cells that we need so that we could convert our sugars into our gall. Our fermentation, we have 12 horizontal stainless steel wash bags. They are in pairs. So normally in the, in, in the I guess the who are familiar with, with brewing uh, in terms of um, beers and so are familiar with horizontal wash bags. But in the rum industry, most of our wash bags are vertical open cone shape. But here we have Renegade Rome have, have 12 horizontal closed wash bags, 40,000 liters in capacity. Um, and we have a fermentation scheme with, uh, with heat exchangers and pumps and sample point that because we, we, we have a temperature control um, fermentation system. Now, the question here might ask well, why closed fermenters uh, or horizontal fermenters? We, we believe that it is proven that in terms of, imagine that that is 40 feet long i mean number one if you have that standing vertically the yeast and the osmotic pressure that that will be exerted on the yeast at the bottom of that fermenter will be so great that the yeast would not be happy and if you have unhappy yeast you will have off notes and and you will not get a profile of room that you want secondly the, the position of our horizontal fermenters mean there's a larger surface area to volume ratio for the yeast to act upon the, 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 the sugars in the juice and, and consequently give us um, a better uh, alcohol and or obviously a better profile of rum that we desire. And thirdly, in terms of in terms of settling, um, because there, there is the, the distance is shorter in terms of settling at the bottom, we will have we will have more less solids and things going to our our steels when, when we're ready to process that rum. So the, the horizontal wash marks have that advantage mainly because of the fact that we want the yeast to be happy, we want a, a better volume rate, um, surface area to volume ratio interaction, and um, and for the for 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 sedimentation purposes, the fermentation scheme here we have you could see six different um, heat exchangers on it. Each, each heat exchanger works for a pair of wash bar. And as I said, our process is temperature control. The yeast that we use work best between thirty two and thirty six degrees Celsius. Um, so we, what we want to do, because you know the process of fermentation is exotomic, it gives off a lot of heat, and we want to control that. So we have a chiller, and we have a set point at 32 degrees Celsius. Um, once the temperature starts exceeding that, exceeding 36, the our, our chiller will come and automatically recirculate or exchange heat in our wash bag and bring back that down to 32 degrees Celsius. So it's like it's like living in, in the summer with an AC room. And you have a hard day, you feel uncomfortable. Yeast are, my, my, are microorganisms also, and they need to feel comfortable. If they're comfortable, they work better. Like in your office, if you're working in a hot office, obviously you will be less productive than if you work in a properly air conditioned or office. And that is the same thing we try to achieve with the yeast. So keep, to have a happy yeast, you have happy run profiles, and then, and in the end, you have a happy product. And so that is why we, we, um, we have that and we pay, pay particular attention to our heat exchange system and ensure it is working properly and control the temperatures. Another advantage of that is that if you have, you could, you could, <laughs> you, you could lengthen your fermentation, for example, because you know you could control it in terms of the, the, the rate at which the yeast cells are multiplying. I mean, if you, want, if you don't want your yeast cells to multiply very fast, you, you might go down to a lower temperature, which you could do here so that you don't, you, know, you don't deactivate it completely, but you know you, you limit or you control the, the growth of, of the yeast cells. And consequently, that if you want a longer fermentation, or you have a, partic a particular breakdown or holiday and you want it to go over the weekend, you could control it so that you don't ferment rapidly. And at the end, get bacteria fermentation because your alcohol don't form right. You take a longer, slower fermentation, like baking, baking a, a pie or making cookies or so, or cake. You control the temperature of the oven, you don't just overcook it 
and and so so that you could um, you could actually get the flavor and and that what, what you want. Fermentation monitoring is key uh, also. I mean, <laughs> we are fearful of bacteria because sugarcane juice attract bacteria very easily. So we, we tend to have bacteria controlling our fermentation because of, of, of that and we pay particular attention of it. Um, the pH of our juice is recorded. That is one of the ways we find out if you have a lot of bacterial activity. So we monitor the pH as the fermenters go down. And we try to avoid it going below three below the lower pH of three because right there we know we get acidic and bacterial fermentation. Or wash back life cycle after 10 hours or so, we started recording the breaks, the pH every four hours. So every four hours, our process operator will go and take those readings until you wash back for, for or the, the formulation is complete. We do cells comes in between. As I spoke earlier about temperature control, and we have a set point for recirculation and cooling and our fermentation scheme. And all that is recorded on our ProTrace and our traceability, um, our traceability program. So you could see a particular fermenter and know that your rum comes from washback 42A, and you can know this life cycle of that fermenter. It was started on, it fermented, it start, the fermentation started on the, on the 27th of May, 2024. It ended on the 31st of May, 2024. The fermentation was X amount of hours. It goes to the pot still, and, and on, the, on the 1st of, of June, Consequently, the, the, the pot still take 10 hours for to produce that batch of rum. Then it goes down to the, the, the cast house on the on the second of June, and then it, you dilute and put it in a cast on the on the second of or the third of June, then you blend on the on whatever date uh, because you um you leave it, you know the amount of years it or the age or the days it stays in the cask and so on. And that lines up to a full traceability. Our distillation system at Renegade Rum, of course, is we have two stills. Sorry, we have two stills. And, uh, we have a coffee still. Um, distillation is continuous. We have 19 plates in the stripper column and 16 in the rectifier. And the capacity there is 3,600 liters per hour. And then we have the traditional Caribbean pot still for oh, we have our full of full of um, body rums. The design is a double retort. So batch distillation and the capacity is. 10,000 liters per batch, both from four sides of, the, of Scotland. The distillation monitoring, of course, as I said, our process is fully automated. We have a scatter system where our distillers will monitor things like temperature control. So to your left, you will see the column still, and you will see the, the, the flow rate as it goes into the steel, the temperature that it goes at, the temperature at the base of the column, at the top of the column, the pressure. And you can also see the, the, rate, the, the percentage ABV of the liquid that of the distillate that comes out and the flow rate and so on. Consequently, for the pot still is the same monitoring system. You see the temperature of the pot, the temperature of the retorts, the and the, temp, the retort one and retort two, your your volumes of of um high wines or first cut, second cut, and third cut, as you see, or head, heads, hearts, and tails. And and so we have a, that is fully monitored by on um on our scatter system. And consequently, again, all that is recorded in our process. So the length of a particular distillation is recorded. So for example, if we charge that port 10,000 liters, then you know what time it starts, what time it ends. And you know that particular room took eight or 10 hours for distillation. Same for the column still, the start and the stop time. And, and all, all is recorded in terms of farm field and variety of sugar cane also. Then we go to maturation and aging. Which speaks to the type of cask we use. We have American oak, ex bourbon, we have American virgin, um, we have some French ex wine, and we have some Andean oak. So that forms the basis of the cask that we age in and forms the basis of our blends also. Fermentation is key, as I mentioned earlier, that we sugar cane juice fermentation it is very important that you control bacteria. We have a three step sanitation process. To mitigate or to prevent that that type of um, bacterial intrusion, and um, it speaks of a pre rinse, a caustic rinse, and a final rinse. Additionally, again, we have daily cleanup formulas. So after processing on the meal every day, we spend time cleaning it out, washing it down, and and CIP in all the tanks, all the juice tanks, the fermentation tanks. Also, and then we have weekly physical review of wash marks and tanks to ensure that spray balls and shallow areas are corrected so that we don't have any film or bacterial growth inside it. 
So we, we take a lot of pride in terms of raw fermentation of our CIP and our sanitation processes. The environmental compliance and sustainability part of Renegade Rum is very important also. We have a treat, we have a wastewater treatment system which speaks of a, a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary um, wastewater treatment system. We have an effluent sump where, the, where the, we have all the effluent will go out first. Um, note, it is important to note we have we have a heat recovery skill also. So when that effluent comes out at 90 degrees from the stills, we 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 have a we we, we use that heat to preheat the incoming wash. So that temperature, so the incoming wash temperature increases and the the temperature of the effluent decreases, which means that it goes out at 40 degrees Celsius at our set point. And we have that put that into a sump. That sump we, we pump it up to those three tanks you're looking at in the photo. One is a sludge tank. We have a filter system at the top where you remove all the solids. And the second and third one, uh, what we call our stabilization tank, where we balance our pH, our final temperature controls, and so on. And that when it is balanced and controlled, we have an infiltration trench where we send it down at the back, where we where we have what we call a phytoremediation. So it goes down into that trench, and that that it walks through the soils. The soils, the plants there will remove all the toxins and so on from it. And by the time that is ready to go to our mangrove, our mangrove system, and so it is clean, fresh food, fresh water. We also boast of the fact we have a third party team of um, students of. Environmentalists from the our university that monitor the, the, the mangrove system and the water, do water quality tests to ensure that um, we are not loading too much into the receiving environment. But uh, but more importantly, that 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 effluent after it's treated, it is used by our agriculture manager for what we call foot irrigation. Uh, so we use it back in our cane fields to fertilize, to irrigate the cane fields and so on. The sludger comes out in the first tank, it could use it to make baggers. Sorry, not bad, sorry, but um, compost and so on. And, 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 and again, could be applied to the field. And most importantly here is the baggers after the sugarcane is, is milled. We use it, we have a biomass boiler, which is photons. Um, and we use that baggers as a source of fuel and to provide energy in that, to that boiler so we could provide steam for the rest of the plant. Now, the, as I said, the plant, the baggers, the boiler is about photons which is 400 kilograms per hour, but we maybe need about 2,000 kilograms per hour of steam to run the plant. And so we have an excess of 1,000 plus, close to 2,000 kilograms if we run it at full capacity. And so we have all a cogeneration, an OC, organic ranking cycle, where that excess steam is going to convert into electricity, which helps back using the plant. It's not enough, convert enough to run the plant, but it could give you a good 12 to 13% on our consumption. Our OC system, could generate up to 60, 60 to 70 kilowatts per hour, depending on the amount of steam that we send to it. And on a given day, our consumption of the plant, when everything is running, is around 200, 290, 295 kilowatts per hour. So if we get 60 out of that 295, then we get a, a fairly okay percentage, as I say, in terms of help for, for on, our, on our fuel, cons on our electricity consumption. And as we all know, the price of, of electricity around the world is influenced by the price of fuel. And it is relatively high here in Guinea. Our product blends. We have different blends at the Renegade Rum. Um, as I said, the first one is our precast, which is fairly the time on this year. The precast is our, our age one. That was a single farm, a single field, single tower, single variety. And that was done specifically to prove the tower concept. So you have different farms, you have different towers. And you have different um, variety of cane, and you compare that without aging, without anything. That is God given. That is what is produced from the land. Um, we didn't add anything to it. We just we we maintain the fermentation for each farm as the same. All the fermentation parameters were the same. All the distillation parameters were the same, and just compare the spirits and see. And so that was give us to our precast rum, our renegade precast. So I say it was not a blend. It is that is what you get from 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 nature. That is nothing, it was just basically to compare and contrast the different towers. And of course, we did another one where we compare and contrast the different distillation expression, and that's our precast. Then we have the etudes or the micro region, is where we took the precast and we aged them for 12 months and a little or 14 months. And from the same farm, same field, same tower, 
and so it it so it speaks down to what is that what the rum would be like after fourteen, after fourteen months or twelve months. So I said earlier, Renegade is not just a spirit production project; it's also a study. And so we study how how aging after of that particular rum for twelve months actually is 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 how it is as compared to the precast. Then we have so we call it the etudes or the micro region. Then we have a, a single farm cuvee, which means uh, one farm, but different terroirs. So the cuvee is, uh, so as I said, the, 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 the precast was just one farm, one terroir, one field, and you compare them. Now, the single farm cuvee is, you take from all that, from one farm, you take the different terroirs and you put it together with different distillation expression and different oak types. So you get a little more complexity. There. You understand? So that the building, so the, so you start building, it's like building blocks. The single farm, the, the, the precast was like the first block. Then you go to the, the micro region and the etudes, you build another block. And then you go to the single farm, Kube, which is uh, more complex and you get more complex flavors. And so on. And so it's, it's like building blocks. Then you go to the Renegade Nova, which is multiple farms, and multiple towers, and multiple varieties with both distillation expression. And that is the essence of Grenada because we have farms in the north and the south of the island. So we took those farms and we bring it together because we. Because we have proven the concept that that the towers really do exist and the different towers give you different and different farms give you different flavors. Flavors. We take the farms in the north, blend them up with the farms in the south, and that is a true expression of Grenada, as we call it, the the the, the, the red nova. And then we have what we call a cuva, a cuva, sorry, aura. And the aura now is remember the first one was just single farm, single field, single tower on each. The cuva, the the aura cuva now is a more intense flavors. At, at the most, with a very vibrant expression of on age now, but is bringing different farms and different towers together in an on age farm. So it's like a, it's like the backbone the renegade is a, the vertebrae, the main vertebrae, and the, the, the ribs, the extension is those products of it, the micro, the, the the renegade precast, the renegade single farm kube, the renegade or uh, the renegade nova. So renegade is in the middle. As the backbone, as the main vertebrae, and all those that goes out uh, comes from 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 it, basically. Uh, again, I will, I, I love to explain, and I'm tired here, I may say, but it is those like renegade is not just production, but it's studying how you could bring complexity together, bring flavors together, bring bring different profiles together from different distillation expression, from different towers, from different profiles of rum, from different types of oak, and bring it together to form one complex. Um, profile. Question and answers, and thank you. I think that comes to the end of our presentation. Wow, that was uh, pretty amazing, Devin. I'm, I'm very rarely lost for words, but it's just it's phenomenal what you guys are doing from from the field to the bottle and the level of thought that's going into every step along the way. I think it's. It's great to see. I don't think Grenada gets as much kind of noise in the in the universe as some other rum producing islands and nations. So it's kind of great to to get a little peek behind the curtain there. I'm sure we're going to get kicked off by the team in just a second. We have loads and loads of great questions. So maybe we're going to have to do a, a follow up Instagram video or a, another little session like this to answer some of these questions. Um, if we could ask just or maybe one or two before we get kicked off. Just a very quick one here in, from, from Liz. In terms of the yeast, you mentioned that you're rehydrating them. So are you buying commercial yeast? Is it your own proprietary strain? Are you allowing any ambient activity with yeast? So well, currently we're buying uh, a commercial yeast from Lalaman, from Lalaman um, Biofuels. Um, it's a it's a special yeast for rum, for the rum agricole industry. But uh, we also are in conversation with them to have our own proprietary strain of yeast. Very, very cool. Um, one question that someone asked that I was thinking myself, I think this was from Vaughan, but you mentioned, I saw on the slide there were eight draw points on that column still. So is there a, are you using all eight? Is there a significant difference in ABV or character depending on where you draw? Um, could you maybe just dive into that just very briefly? Yeah, well, so far we have used around six of them and um, we have found different, the, the, we run, run, run it on our GC machine. We found different um, profiles in the rum, of course. At the lower, the lower set, you get a heavier bodied rum. Um, at the higher set, you get uh, a lighter rum. The higher set of us, you get a lighter rum. 
Um, so yes, the answer is yes. You get different flavors from different from different valves, and we uh, to prove that also we we try different this different valves from the same fermenter to ensure that because rum is made in fermentation. I mean, in distillation, we just extract. So we use the same fermenter to try different valves, and we realize that the different valves do indeed give you different profiles based on the way you take it out. In relation to the, the body of the rum, um, the organoleptics on it, and, and the ABV also. The higher you take out, you get a higher ABV. All right. That's fantastic. And then final question, I think, before we're going to have to go, but obviously you're working with four different varieties of cane across 14 different farms. So you mentioned throughout the year you're going to get differences in yield. Are you getting different BRICS levels off of those as well? And is there a particular BRICS level that you're looking for? That's a question from Nick. Yeah, sure, we do. We do. And um and we have so we have different varieties that have different fiber contents. And um, but the main thing we measure here is bricks. And we have one we call Laculum Red, which gives us a, a higher bricks, independent of the time of the year, it bricks is always higher. We have one we give us more juice, of course. So we have a lot of studies, a lot of data collected over the years also that we know which sugarcane variety give us a higher bricks, which give us more juice. And we see it re reflected in our fermentation process also. So we get a higher ABV in the fermenter when we have the one with, with more bricks, with the higher bricks as compared to the one with the lower bricks and, and so on. So the variety, the, the difference in variety as it relates to bricks, um, volume of juice, they, they, do, they do make a difference in terms of variety. Fantastic. Fantastic. Because I met, you said you started with six. So obviously the other two that you no longer use, they just weren't as yeah. commercially viable yeah, for longer term. Yeah, I think I think um what our culture manager would have expressed in terms of the most susceptible to diseases and so. So um, he's trying to have control over, over over those. Fantastic. Well, I think that's everything we have time for. But Devin, thank you very much for being so transparent, so open and sharing your, your passion and your expertise. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Don't forget to check out um, all of these videos you can find on our YouTube channel. Um, our next video coming up on the 11th of June will be with Joyce Spence and David Morrison from Appleton Rum. Um, so don't look forward to that one there. And if you haven't already done so, please do complete that feedback poll. Um, great to see many people here from all over the world. It's great to see that excitement for these sessions and hopefully we'll be able to organize some more. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you very soon. Have a great week. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you.